Thank you for joining us as we continue our journey through the Book of Romans. My name is Catherine Sipper, and I'm a member of Hernando Church of the Nazarene. Last week, we saw how we are to patiently wait on God, knowing he is always at work in our lives. This morning, our study of Romans, focusing on chapters 3, verses 1 through 8, and chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, these remind us that God is always faithful. He always has been and always will be. And God's faithfulness does not fail. Through today's lesson, lesson, we will develop a new or a renewed awareness that God's purposes do not fail, despite our human tendencies to reject or resist his will. But before we begin, I'd like to start with the ending. After studying God's word for this morning, I was immediately reminded of this passage of scripture I want to share with you from Lamentations in the Old Testament, chapters 3, verses 19 through 26, and it reads this way. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Let me repeat that. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. If you remember nothing else from this morning's lesson, remember this, God is faithful. Now let's get started and go back to the beginning. Consider these what I'd like to call um, life anchor points to help us all stay strong spiritually. Keep in mind the speaker is Paul. Life anchor point number one, God is faithful regardless of what we do. And that's found in the beginning of our first passage in Romans chapter three, verses one through four. And I'll read that. Verse 1, what advantage then is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true, and every human being be a liar as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Now, Paul had begun his treatment of the righteousness of God in Romans by arguing that God rightly revealed his wrath against all unrighteous people. His argument in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 33, focused on the sinful behavior typical of the Gentile world. But in Romans 2, he pointed towards the sins of Jewish people and declared that circumcision, the symbol of Judaism, was a matter of the heart rather than of the flesh. This raised the question of whether Jews had any advantage or any special place with God. While Paul states that they did, he does not get around to describing those advantages until Romans chapter 9. His first question is whether the sins of the Jewish people, unfaithfulness, will nullify God's faithfulness. God's covenant relationship with Israel had obligations for both God and Israel. Did Israel's breaking of the covenant mean that the covenant no longer held? and God was free to not follow through on his obligations? Those who are aligned with God in their inmost being are the faithful. So Paul asks 
what advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in super circumcision? He says that the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. Now, Paul maintains that the Jews have a wonderful advantage, which is that they've been entrusted with God's words. Paul then gets to the heart of the matter and the heart of our session today. Despite having been entrusted with the very words of God, if some of, Jew, some of the Jews were unfaithful to the covenant, do their actions mean that God's faithfulness will be nullified? Hmm. What is God's faithfulness based upon? Is it contingent upon our actions? We need to remember that God is always faithful despite what we do or not do. Does God's faithfulness eliminate the effects of our choices? No. Our choices still have consequences. Why is God's truth supreme above all? Because nothing can stand up against God's truth. Even when people reject his truth, it still remains true. Paul's answer is that God is always faithful regardless of what Israel did or did not do. The same is true today. God is faithful regardless of what we do. But this does, this does mean that God's blessings in our lives will be the same whether we are obedient or disobedient. But a broken relationship always has painful consequences. So let's move on to life anchor point number two. God is righteous when he judges. And this we'll discover in Romans chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Starting in verse 5. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument, Paul says. Certainly not. If that were so, how could judge God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. Now, how could these verses possibly be a life anchor point? Let's see why. God is always faithful because God is always righteous. Thus, God must judge sin, but that is evidence of his faithfulness, not unfaithfulness. The judgment of God is always right because he is always faithful. A perverted kind of logic might ask the question, if our sin demonstrates God's righteousness when he punishes us, shouldn't he cut us a little bit of slack? After all, our sin makes him look better by punishing us. Paul rightly rejects such an idea. Lessening punishment erodes the justice of God rather than enhancing it. Paul addresses anyone making the arguments or something similar. If God can bring good out of evil, thus displaying mercy and righteousness, let's help God out and provide more opportunities for God to do just that. Hmm. If God is always faithful, then my faithfulness shouldn't matter. If my sinfulness enhances God's truthfulness and glory, why should he punish me? What is the danger for ourselves and others in not accepting responsibility for our own sinful choices? If we refuse to participate in God's will, both for ourselves and for humankind, God must judge us accordingly, but he will not be deterred in seeking to accomplish his will in other ways through other people. Because God is always faithful, 
and always righteous, God consistently pursues his will in our lives. The key word here is consistently. Let's move on to the next anchor point. Life anchor point number three. God has faithfully blessed Israel. And this is found in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. And it reads this way. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My consciousness confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship, Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. When Paul returns to the faithfulness of God to Israel, a subject he raised in Romans 3, 1 and 2, he is still wrestling with how God's judgment of Israel impacted his faithfulness to Israel. In Romans chapter 9, the apostle is deeply concerned about whether Israel has so broken the covenant that God has abandoned them, excuse me. He will ask this question through Romans chapter 9, through chapter 11 before finally answering that God's promises to Israel still hold as we read in Romans 11 25b through verse 29 and it reads this way Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in and in this way all Israel will be saved as it is written the deliverer will come from Zion. He will, re he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, it continues, the passage continues, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. The advantages God has given Israel are many and significant. They were God's children. They experienced the glory of Mount Sinai. God had made several covenants with them. God had given them the Torah, the temple worship, and many promises. The patriarchs, with their stories of God's faithfulness, was Israel's heritage. Most of all, God had sent the Messiah to Israel. Such wonderful blessings were evidence of God's faithfulness to Israel over the centuries. And now, through Jesus Christ, we are part of this heritage. Our great heritage of the faith is also a blessing showing God's faithfulness to us. The stories of the Old and New Testament, the great saints and leaders of church history, the existence and translations of the Bible and the gift of Christ and the Holy Spirit are part of our heritage, praise God. They show that God has been faithful in blessing us through the past centuries. Now we come to our final life anchor point for this morning. Life anchor point number four, God's sovereign choice. Or in other words, God blesses all whom he chooses. And this is found in Romans 9 verses 6 through 8, and it reads this way. It is not as though God's word had failed, 
for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, as Paul writes, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Excuse me. God's faithfulness to Israel often raises the question of whether God has played favorites with Israel. If this is true, then God can rightly be charged with being unfair and thus unrighteous. Paul appeals to Israel's founding story to argue that God's faithfulness to Israel never kept God from being gracious to other people. Paul believed God had done everything possible to help Israel recognize and accept their Messiah. What was it that has always marked people as Abraham's children or true Israel, according to Paul? Faith, not lineage or circumcision. Let me read that again. What was it that has always marked people as Abraham's children or true Israel, according to Paul? Faith, not lineage or circumcision. What might this tell us about God's desire for all people. God's blessings are intended for all humanity, not just those from a certain bloodline. God chose Abraham to be the vehicle through which all peoples would be blessed. And, but Abraham had many descendants whom God blessed, even though not all of them became the ancestors of the Jewish people. God blessed, God blessed Ishmael and Esau but not in the same way he blessed Isaac and Jacob. Today's session offers a stark contrast. On the one hand, it describes the foolish decision many Jews made to reject Jesus as their Messiah. On the other hand, it documents the unfailing love of God for his people. To all of us, whether Jew, or Gentile, we are reminded of God's love and his grace. God blesses each person in different ways and calls each of us to different tasks. No follower of Christ is left out, but our responsibility is not to compare our blessings and callings with those of others. Our responsibility is to be faithful to the God who is always faithful. Let me repeat that. Our responsibility is to be faithful to the God who is always faithful. Today, we have explored the reality of God's faithfulness. No matter our actions, nothing will nullify God's faithfulness. So in closing, let's reflect this week on the first part of a powerful hymn that reminded me of this lesson and has great meaning for all of us. It goes like this. I'm sure you'll recognize it. No, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> That's not my gift, but I'll read it. Uh, it goes like this. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, excuse me. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me.
In recalling the words of Psalm 23, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Because, and repeat this to yourself each time, because great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Recalling the words of Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, because great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Recalling the words of Matthew 28, verse 20. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Because, and repeat this to yourself, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Recalling the words of Hebrews 13, verse 5. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, because great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Remember, friends, it's Christ who lives within us, who gives us the will and the power through his amazing grace to desire and do his perfect will. We hope that you join us in our worship service to follow. If you have any questions or need special prayer, please contact Hernando Church of the Nazarene through our website, www.hernaz.org. Remember, great is God's faithfulness. Be blessed this week and amen.